In July 1921, China's various communist cells and study groups finally coalesced into the Communist Party of China. In early 1923, it would undergo a major strategic shift as it entered into the United Front with the Guomindang. But while histories of China often like to jump straight from the founding into the CCP's United Front work, the party didn't just sit around doing nothing for the two years in between. In fact, the work the party did between 1921 and 1923 is vitally important to understand, since it lets us get a glimpse of what the party might have been like had it followed a more traditional revolutionary path. Communist histories. For the next two episodes of my series on the Chinese Revolution, I'm going to be focusing closely on two specific organizing campaigns of the CCP. But understand that this wasn't the only work the party was doing. At the first National Congress in July 1921, the party committed itself to organize organizing labor unions in China's most industrialized regions, to target the nation's small, localized proletariat. And representatives headed out throughout the country, mostly to their home regions. This video will be about two of the most successful of these campaigns, in Hunan and Jiangxi provinces. In both of these campaigns, Mao Zedong played a key role. Now, it's important to understand that Mao was not an exceptionally important member of the party at this time. He was the leading party member in Hunan, but that wasn't saying much. Hunan was considered something of a provincial backwater at the time. I'm covering the campaigns that Mao worked on, partly because they were exceptionally successful, but also largely because Mao's later importance in China means that the work he was directly involved in is much more well documented. So I have a lot more to talk about. After the founding of the CCP, Mao Zedong's first party assignment was to return home to Changsha, the capital of Hunan, to head up the Changsha Labor Secretariat. Changsha was where Mao had done most of his pre-Marxist reformist activism, including founding a worker school, so Mao knew the city very well. And he knew it didn't have very much, much potential when it came to unionizing work. Changsha did not have much of an industrial base. So Mao began looking further abroad, and it wasn't long before he discovered the mining district of Anyuan. Anyuan is technically in Jiangxi province, but right on its mountainous forested border with Hunan. During China's 1898 reforms, the Pingxiang Railway and Mining Company was founded, which in a very short time bought out and consolidated the region's 321 small coal mines into one massive industrialized mining complex. By 1910, it produced over 2,200 tons of coal a day, and was the largest Chinese-owned mine in the country. Wanting a total monopoly over its workers' lives, the company established its own cafeteria, savings bank, court, hospital, and zoo. It built its own railway to the mine, which was patrolled by its own police force, which routinely searched incoming trains to stop agitators, and made so much money in fines the police became known as the gods of wealth. Despite this, the real power in Anyun was the local gang, the Red Gang. By 1920, the dragon head of the gang officially served as advisor to the company. Many of the miners were gang members. In particular, almost all of the mine's supervisors, who had direct control over the workers on a day-to-day -day basis. Which isn't to say they held power through force alone. The gang promoted itself as working in the miners' interests and helping them negotiate with the company but it did very little to actually improve working conditions. There were about 10,000 miners in Anyuan, and around 1,000 somewhat more educated railway workers. The miners had the worst lot. The temperatures in the pits were consistently around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There was a day crew and night crew, each working 12-hour shifts with no safety equipment. They weren't even provided with clothing, other than a single three-foot-long blue cloth which they wore above ground as a loincloth, 
but in the mines had to be rewrapped as a turban to help against head injuries. It was also their only washcloth, and could be used as a makeshift gas mask in case of an accident in the mine. Which there were plenty of. Between 1905 and 1920, 450 workers died in mining accidents. And in 1920, things got even worse for the miners, as the end of World War I led to a collapse in coal prices, and decrease in the already meager wages. And nearby warlords began conscripting workers into their armies. So it should come as no surprise that shortly after Mao arrived in Changsha, the Labor Secretariat received a letter from some of An Yuan's railway workers, begging for some kind of help. Mao was born in a small town not too far from An Yuan, and he had a distant relative who worked as a supervisor there. So Mao went to stay with his relative, and began researching, researching conditions around the mine. Years later, Mao said at this time, In those years, after receiving some education in Marxism, I imagined I was a revolutionary. But as it turned out, when I got to the coal mine and began to interact with the workers, because I was still a student at heart and a teacher in style, the workers wouldn't buy it. We didn't know how to proceed. Looking back now, it's pretty amusing. I spent the whole day just walking back and forth along the rail railroad tracks, trying to figure out what to do. Only when we dropped our pretentious airs and respected the workers as our teachers did things change. Later we chatted with the workers, sharing our genuine feelings, and the worker comrades gradually began to get close to us, telling us what was really on their minds. In his discussions with the workers, Mao came to the conclusion that the first step would be starting a school. But he had responsibilities at the labor secretariat, and had to be head back to Changsha right away. The actual work of starting the school would fall to a young communist recently returned from studying in France. Li <music> Lisan was 22, and came from an intellectual family that lived near Anyuan. Being a near local was very important. Both Mao and Li would have seemed very alien to the workers at Anyuan, most of whom wouldn't have ever spoken to intellectuals before. But once they began actually talking, Mao and Li spoke the same, very region-specific dialect as the workers, which made them much more approachable. Mao instructed Li to take things very slowly. Just educating the workers would be a good start. He knew that angering the company or the Red Gang before Li had any kind of mass support could be fatal. So Li petitioned the local magistrate in exceedingly flowery classical Chinese for official support in establishing a worker school. He argued it would cut down on gambling and opium, and therefore increase production. The magistrate was very impressed and agreed. Lee opened his school. He immediately got 30 to 40 students, but they were primarily the children of railway workers. He took what he could get, though, and used the children as an excuse to meet with their parents. Once he talked to the parents, he could convince them to come to night school. And once the railway workers were coming to night school, he asked them to convince their minor friends to come as well. To avoid conflict, he required minors to get permission from their Red Gang supervisors before coming to class. This had the added benefit of getting low-level Red Gang members interested in classes as well. Once he had an audience, he began incorporating politics into the lesson. His focus was combining literacy and revolution. For example, he showed how when the characters for worker, gongren, are placed vertically, they become heaven, ten. When Lili San first opened the school I joined, our text was a thousand character reader, but his lectures stressed the exploitation and oppression of the workers. Someone stood guard at the classroom door to keep outsiders from eavesdropping. Later on, stencils of Marx's ideas were handed out to us for study. If outsiders happened to come by, we covered the stencils with a thousand character reader. Lee became something of a rock star on Yuan. He was emotive and excited, and gave impassioned speeches about the working conditions. Rather than downplaying his intellectual status, he doubled down on it, and presented himself as a great educator. He wore a metal button that eventually led to a belief that he was immune to bullets. And he was allegedly quite popular with the ladies. At one night class, some workers saw one of Lee's journals, which referred to a Shanghai Textile Workers Club to advance their collective interests. They asked Lee if it would be possible to do the same thing at Anyuan. Obviously, he was thrilled, and helped them draft a proposal. They presented it to the magistrate. Now, the magistrate 
had no idea what a union was. The club's motto was, forge friendships, nurture virtue, provide unity and mutual aid, and seek common happiness. And that all seemed quite nice. So we okayed it. On May Day 1922, the Anuan Railway and Mining Workers Club was officially launched, with hundreds of members and Lee as director. Our teacher's home is in Li Ling, but the ancestral founder of our school lives far, far away. To find him, one must cross the Seven Seas. He's now more than a hundred years old, and his name is Teacher Ma, a bearded grandpa. The Union had big plans. Because the railway company controlled so many aspects of the workers' lives, Lee Lee San believed their first goal should be, should be building local, worker-run institutions of, to challenge and eventually supplant pre-existing support networks. In addition to, to more schools, this meant opening a consumer cooperative, which offered basic necessities at below market costs. They also started a patrol team of ex-Red Gang members known for their martial arts skills. They protected workers, provided security for the club, and gathered intel on comp company operations. Lee also began to recruit members into the Communist Party. One member said of his initiation, the oath swearing took place in a rented upstairs room on the walls of which there were pictures of Marx, Engels, Rosa Luxemburg, and Karl Liebknecht. The words of the oath were, sacrifice the individual for the interests of the masses, strictly maintain secrecy, say nothing to fathers, mothers, wives, or children, observe discipline, struggle to the end for revolution. At this point, the mine directors were getting uneasy. But they didn't know what to do. They went back and forth between offering to buy the club out and weak and empty threats. This made the company look even weaker. It didn't help that it was months behind on wage payments due to the collapse of coal prices. Around this time, Mao returned to Anyuan to check on Lili San's progress. On seeing the size of the club and 30 new CCP members, he was overjoyed. And he decided that failure to pay wages would be a great excuse for a strike. Mao had to return to Changsha, but he left clear, clear instructions with Li that this was to be an orderly strike, intended to build sympathy more than express rage, to move the people through righteous indignation. And because he knew Li had a tendency to get overexcited, Mao sent Liu Xiaoqi to help out and make sure things didn't get out of hand. Liu had just returned to China after studying at the, univers the University of the Toilers of the East in Moscow, and was known for his discipline. The strike was prepared as an orderly walkout, with the workers who kept the mine safety systems and the community's electricity staying at work. Lee had been threatened by the company, so decided to keep to the background during the strike and let Leo do the negotiations. Lee instead went to negotiate with the real power. Lee brought gifts to a personal audience with the dragon head of the Red Gang. Possibly because so many Red Gang members were sympathetic to the workers' club, the dragon head agreed not to break the strike, and even to shut down all gambling and opium dens for the duration. With the Red Gang out of the way, the strike could begin. And for five days in September 1922, 13,000 miners and railway workers walked out. Without their Red Gang goons to break it up, the company had no response and agreed to almost all the club's demands, including the payment of back wages, improved working conditions, and recognition and financial support for the Anyuan Railway and Mining Workers Club. On seeing how successful the club could be, almost all the 10,000 miners in Anyuan joined up afterwards, making it essentially the governing body in the district. The Red Gang couldn't compete, and its leader left the region. Li Li San was considered such a success that the party asked him to travel to Wuhan and Shanghai to help organize there. In his place, Liu Xiaoqi became the party's representative in Nanyuan. While less popular with the workers, he was able to build the region up into the center of communist organizing in China for the next three years, becoming known as China's Little Moscow. By 1925, on Yuan accounted for one-fifth of the party's membership. Then, in 1925, the Hunan military garrison finally led an all-out assault in the mines, and the club was shut down. But that wasn't the end. Fired from the mines, thousands of communist miners returned to their homes, where they would be instrumental in forming new communist peasant associations. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Back in 1922, what's Mao been doing that's required him to return to Shangsha so often. 
We'll be following up on that next time with the Luban Temple Strike. Like and subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching.